Okay, good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, one more uh, of the CSSR uh, seminars. Now, now it's a, a webinar. Today, we have the pleasure to have uh, coronary retired Dr. Alex Crowder, with whom uh, I have the pleasure to, to be good friends and uh, to work together in a project at the, the Swedish Defense University. And uh, Dr. Crowder has had an extensive career of government service covering 38 years as an infantry officer, a strategist and a research professor. Uh, his work at the strategic level includes tours at the Army Staff, the Joint Staff J5, uh, the Strategic Studies Institute, the US Ar uh, that is the US Army Think Tank, and the National Defense University in Washington, DC. Uh, without a further delay, like I Alex, the floor is, is yours. Thank you, Yanis, uh, uh, both for uh, the opportunity uh, for doing this and, uh, and for being a friend and colleague for several years. Uh, greetings, everybody. Uh, you can see through the, uh, through the window behind me that I'm in the woods of New England. Uh, you can see that this is an old wooden house. Uh, I inherited this house, and so my, uh, while I'm lecturing you, my wife is trying desperately to drag this house into the 20th century. So we've deployed forward here for uh, for uh, uh, the month to uh, to work on our house. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, hybrid gray zone things like that um, and uh, and what they're all about because there's a lot of people who uh, who throw around these phrases uh, without a real understanding of of you know are they the same are they different things like that are they even useful as paradigms. So I'm going to bring up my slides here, um, and we're going to talk about this. Uh, Ken, Giannis, can you see those slides? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, these three things. Um, um, you can see there I work full-time at Florida International University as a cyber professor. I'm also a non-resident senior fellow at SIPA. And as Janis mentioned, I work with the Swedish Defense University. Uh, so is it hybrid? Is it the gray zone? No, it's political warfare. And <laughs> political warfare has always existed, right? Uh, political warfare, which is the use of all elements of national power to gain political objectives, right? It, it's real simple. Uh, and so hybrid and gray zone uh, are uh, are labels that we seek to put on, and honestly, it's in the West, right? Um, although the Russians refer to hybrid warfare, uh, they refer to it uh, as as a, a Western thing. It's not a, it's not a Russian conceptualization, right? Uh, gray zone. It's not a Chinese conceptualization, you know. If you want to talk about what the what the Russians uh, think about it, uh, you know, you can talk about new generation warfare. If you want to talk about how, what the Chinese think about it, you think about the the three warfares. But it isn't hybrid and it isn't the gray zone. But really, what it all boils down to is political warfare. The problem is political warfare is is too. My opinion is political warfare is too difficult a concept for many people to get their heads around, and so they just don't want to use it. So uh, we're going to go through a couple of slides here that talk about the gray zone, and uh, down at the bottom of each of these pages is the, the source, and I've sourced it from a, different, a bunch of different people, all of whom I respect. This one's from Hal Brands. If you haven't read Hal Brands stuff, you really should. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Hal when he started out uh, 15 years ago, uh, writing about the Western Hemisphere when I was at the Strategic Studies Institute, uh, and now he's in Washington, D.C., and he writes very cogently about strategy and grand strategy, um, and so I recommend his stuff. Uh, so, gray zone, coercive and aggressive, but stays below the threshold of conventional military conflict, right? That threshold uh, that would allow a military response. Uh, and here's, uh, here's my graphic on uh, trying to explain it. Um, 
I've, I've seen graphics that talk about the spectrum of conflict, but the spectrum of conflict, we're, we're not in conflict with most states. There's about 196 states in the world. Um, and, you know, we're in alliance and partnership with a lot of them, right? If you think about NATO alone, that's, the, that's 30 countries. If you think about major non-NATO allies for the United States, that's another 15 or so. You know, and we're partners with a bunch of other different countries like like that would uh, that would describe our relationship with India, for instance, or South Africa uh, or Brazil. So um, so I, I expanded the spectrum of competition out into a spectrum. Sorry, the spectrum of conflict, which is that upper end. I expanded it out to an entire spectrum of competition because we're in competition with everybody. Even our close allies like the UK and Canada, we're in competition for uh, for influence, for instance, or for market share. Um, so, so really, everybody needs to be here. So you see where that gray zone is, that threshold triggering a military response. <clears throat> That's really, um, if you want to speak about the United Nations Charter, which is where a lot of this thinking derives from, including uh, the NATO treaty, um, the uh, UN Charter talks about armed attack uh, or use of force, right? And so uh, that threshold right there is when you receive an armed attack or a use of force, you are allowed to use the military, uh, you're allowed to use any, any tool in the toolbox in response. Typically, that triggering uh, threshold is one of four things. Um, property is damaged, property is destroyed, people are hurt, people are killed, right? Under international law. Um, if you uh, want to talk about cyber and you read the Tallinn Manual 2.0, they have exactly, what they've done is they've gone into international law and they've pulled out all the uh, before war, during war, uh, juice ad bello, juice in bello. Uh, they've pulled all the international law stuff out and then uh, looked at it through the lens of cyber. And they, they define it with the same uh, four uh, different, uh, different criteria. So if they don't meet that criteria, one of those four criteria, it's not a use of force and you can't use force against them. And this is this is what they're doing. They've figured out how to discombobulate us without our ability to use our fearsome military. NATO, NATO as a military, even the U.S. military alone is is a monster, right? I've I've been in combat with the United States military, and and they're a buzzsaw, right? You do not want to get into a straight up fight with the U.S. military, which is why. Uh, adversaries choose uh, asymmetric methods on the battlefield, as we've seen in Afghanistan and Iraq, right? And gray zone operations uh, in the, not in the battle zone, but in the rest of the world, because they actually work against us. If you look at that over on the left-hand side, that uh, button, we, we, the United States, and I dare say most of Europe, we know what war is. War is World War II. Two or more sides, uniforms, start date, end date, treaty, right? And so it's uh, that's when you're in a state of war, and the default position when you're not in a state of war is not war, right? Is peace. So if we're not at war with the Russians, then we must be at peace with the Russians. Well, the Russians don't see it that way. They see themselves as being at war with us, and so they're con conducting these operations. Uh, but without meeting all that criteria uh, that we use for being at war. And so uh, our war or not war paradigm is totally uh, not useful in this context. Uh, so here's uh, Lieutenant General Jim Dubik, right? Very smart guy uh, writing about uh, the gray zone. Uh, so there's three modern challenges below the threshold of war, which is what we were just talking about and defeat revolutionary and rogue powers, right? Uh, so the revolutionary powers want to change the international system. Uh, and if you think, if you want to put labels on it, uh, the Chinese want to replace the United States as the global hegemon. 
and Russia believes that the global system was designed to keep them down uh, and they want to change it or destroy it. Interestingly enough, the, uh, uh, the, they're wrong. It wasn't designed to keep them down, uh, but the Soviet Union was invited into the current paradigm uh, and declined because they didn't want to be influenced. They thought it was an influence operation and they didn't want to be influenced. So it wasn't designed to keep them down. It was designed to prevent another occurrence of a world war and the Russians in the guise of the Soviet Union chose not to participate. And then that crossing the threshold of war, now you're talking more like uh, North Korea, Iran, things like that. Rogue power, I believe there uh, refers to North Korea. Uh, why is the gray zone important, right? Uh, because we've been using it for uh, for centuries. That's uh, Mike Mazar uh, publishing at the Strategic Studies Institute, the Army's think tank that Giannis mentioned earlier. And, and you know, they've been doing it for centuries. It's not rocket science. Um, here's more of Mike Mazar. Uh, and here's some interesting things. I'm going to talk about violence later, but the cost of major aggression has become really severe. As Saddam Hussein uh, found out at great cost, when you invade your neighbor, uh, this is a problem, right? And the entire, uh, the entire global community gets together to expel you. Notice during uh, Desert Storm, we even had Syrians and Egyptians on the ground attacking Iraq, which is amazing. Um, and so that's why, uh, that's why the major aggression isn't happening anymore. That's why um, the Crimea operation is so different it's it's conceptually you know the effect is the same that the uh, Iraqis desired which was the annexation of of Kuwait but the techniques that they use are very different which uh, prevents everybody from using tried and true techniques right and then uh, you see in that penultimate paragraph there's new techniques like cyber and information that uh, uh, that uh, land intensity to it, right? And although information is not uh, new, it's been a it's been used for five thousand years, and it's been a challenge since the uh, early 1800s. Uh, every time we do a new iteration from the telegraph in the 1800s to radio to television to the computer, it becomes more and more intense and more and more capable. And as we do globalization, it reaches more and more people. Um, and so here's, uh, here's uh, since we're, uh, I don't want to leave the Chinese out. I don't want this to be all about only Russia. This one's about the uh, Chinese gray zone strategy. But look at that. This, this, is, um, this is a very interesting conceptualization. A lot of people talk about, you know, below the threshold of war and stuff like that. But you don't see very many people talking about the status quo defenders and unappealing options. Like, what do you do if the Russians shut down a, a pipeline in the United States? Do we shut down a pipeline in Russia? Is that really an option, right? So uh, you see uh, politicians waffling, putting off difficult decisions and surrendering the, uh, the initiative, or, uh, you can escalate, right? And so uh, this is hard. The difference is uh, we are rule of law countries in uh, Europe, uh, in North America, our partners and allies like uh, Australia and Japan um, are rule of law countries. And so we have transparency rules. We have rules that prevent uh, us from doing all these operations clandestinely. We have laws to do clandestine operations, but uh, but uh, both Russia and China are ruled by law countries where the law is used uh, to empower the government in controlling their own people, whereas a rule of law country, the law is designed to prevent to limit a government in what they're doing, prevent the government from doing things to their own people and to other countries. And so this uh, this is a, uh, if you look at the Chinese three warfares, this is lawfare, right? Uh, legal warfare. And so they're using our legal system uh, against us. And so uh, 
you know, the Russians have done really well on that, uh, that uh, <coughs> uh, pipeline operation. And we'll get to that a, a little bit later when we talk specific operations. Uh, so we talked about gray zone. Now we're talking about hybrid. We're going to compare the two. Frank Hoffman's the guy who came up with the concept of uh, hybrid warfare in 2008, right? So conventional weapons, irregular tactics, terrorism, and criminal behavior at the same time, right? Notice that NATO is very different. And so why is NATO different? Uh, why didn't NATO just lift Frank Hoffman's definition and say, this is what we're worried about? Well, it's because there's a step that's missing in there because uh, uh, I'm talking about Western perspectives on this. The Russians took hybrid warfare and they looked at it as any culture does through their lens. So uh, they added two major things to this. Uh, number one is uh, they looked at the color revolutions. And Russia and China both believe that the color revolutions are uh, information operations conducted by a U.S.-led coalition, international coalition, designed uh, to eventually overthrow or achieve regime change in both Russia and China, right? They believe that the U.S.-led coalition, including NATO, including the European Union, are using information operations to destabilize countries that we don't like to achieve regime change in these countries. And we're practicing on smaller countries on our way to Russia and China. And so that you saw this uh, in Libya when, uh, when the West said, oh no, we're not going for regime change. We're just protecting the population. The Russians and the Chinese voted yes. And then uh, regime change happened. I'm not saying uh, the Western-led coalition uh, targeted uh, Gaddafi for regime change. I'm saying that their people rose up and killed Gaddafi. Um, but now the Chinese and the Russians believe that that, uh, that that was the proof right there. They had suspected it before that. Now they know that that's what we're doing, right? So uh, <clears throat> second thing is the, the Russians believe that uh, they're, they're – Falling at the end of the Soviet uh, the Soviet era, the end of the Cold War, they believe it was the result of U.S.-led information operations that sapped the will of the Soviet people, right? And so they believe that we're, you know, again, this this parallels that uh, they're doing information operations against us to achieve uh, to achieve regime change, right? And of course, the Russians have been doing information operations for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? Uh, think in terms of like Maskirovka, right? This is not a new concept. This is, a, this is an old Russian concept. And so <clears throat> when the Russians grabbed this, they looked at it through the lens of the, uh, these, uh, the color revolutions and sprinkled a heavy do dose of information on top of it. So NATO isn't responding to Frank Hoffman's definition. It's responding to the Russian conceptualization of hybrid operations. So you see information, cyber, economic pressure, and stuff like that, and even the use of, of, uh, of regular forces, right? But they're not using regular forces typically for violence, and we're going to talk about violence a little bit later. So Frank Hoffman has the original idea. The Russians modify it based on the Russian culture, and so NATO's definition of hybrid is different because they're responding to Russian operations. Uh, so uh, the gray zone, here, here's really the difference, right? The, the gray zone is the where and hybrid is how, right? If you think about it, uh, the where is below the spectrum and the how is uh, bringing everybody together, uh, criminal, non-criminal, armed, non-armed, uh, violent, non-violent, uh, all of those mix of things. So, so here's the difference. They're very different. A lot of people use them interchangeably, but they are different. And then up in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a, a bunch of different, uh, a bunch of different techniques. 
So uh, hybrid is the, the what, the organizational approach, right? And gray zone is, is the where it happens. Uh, so where where are we, where are we competing? Where are the Russians competing with us? And really, it's kind of this line here um, between Narva in Estonia and Tereshtopol in uh, Transnistria, right? And this this is not meant to imply that this is the only place where we're competing, right? Right along that line, uh, indeed, uh, that's kind of the the meeting zone the engagement area between the Russians and the rest of Europe and the United States, the European Union and, uh, and NATO, right? Uh, this is sometimes called the shatter zone, uh, but it's the frontier. Uh, interestingly enough, it's the frontier between uh, Slav and non-Slav. It's the frontier between orthodoxy and, uh, and Catholicism and Protestantism. And so it, it's a lot of, uh, it's, it's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on there. And there's been a lot of stuff going on there uh, for thousands of years, right? The, the Black Sea region uh, has been an area of contention. Uh, the Balkans and uh, the Ukrainian area, Ukraine, Poland, has been an area of contention for a really long, a thousand years easy. Um, and so we're competing with these people. And, and you know what? Um, they told us that they're competing with us or that they're not participating with us. And we missed it. This is 2007. This is uh, Putin at the Munich Security Conference in 2007. And he said, uh, American hegemony is bad. Uh, the current international system isn't working. And uh, we don't like it, right? But 2007, what's happening in 2007? We're losing in Afghanistan, and uh, we're in the middle of the surge in Iraq, right? I was in Baghdad in the summer of 2007, taking 40 to 60 rocket and mortar rounds a day. I didn't have time to listen to Vladimir Putin talk at the, uh, the Munich Security Conference. And so we missed this, but it was a very clear signal. There are people who claim that uh, Putin was signaling this as early as 2004. Remember, he took over in 2000. I haven't found that yet. If anybody else knows what he said in 2004 about that, please let me know. Uh, but this is the first clear signal that he's sending. So we shouldn't have been surprised. It, it took seven years before we got to Crimea. Crimea really is what wakes up everybody. When you change a boundary uh, illegally like that, this catches everybody's attention, right? So this is the, the beginning right here in 2007. Uh, here's some examples of, of what the Russians have done. So, um, hearkening back to NATO expansion and European Union expansion, the Russians demanded a veto over countries joining NATO and the European Union. And so there's two ways of looking at it. There's former Soviet republics, like Ukraine, uh, like Moldova, and then there's... Um, then there's uh, air, uh, <clears throat> um, countries, well, they use the phrase near abroad, countries in the near abroad. So that would be like Poland and, and the then Czechoslovakia. And uh, we, we, the West, did not grant Russia a veto over the European, joining the EU and NATO. So what happened was a bunch of countries went in. Uh, we all know that story. I'm not going to concentrate on it. And so the uh, Narva being only, you know, a uh, uh, hundred, a little over a hundred kilometers from NATO territory, uh, sorry, uh, St. Petersburg being only a, a little over a hundred kilometers from Narva, which is NATO territory, uh, really freaked the, uh, the, the Russians out. There wasn't anything they could do about it at the time, but getting back to this lawfare theory, right, they discovered that uh, the European Union and uh, NATO both have a clause in, uh, it's in the EU treaty and it's not in the Washington treaty, but it's, uh, it's in the writing about what the criteria are for joining NATO. If you go to the nato.int website, it very clearly states it. And it talks about neighborly relations. Interestingly enough, the EU and the, uh, NATO both use exactly the same phrase, neighborly relations. You have to have 
good relations with your neighbors, you have to have a fixed border in order to meet the criteria to join NATO or the European Union. So the Russians figured out all you've got to do is control one square meter of their territory um, against their will, and all of a sudden uh, these countries don't meet the criteria to join the European Union or NATO. So you see what they've done here. Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Ar uh, Armenia uh, all do not meet the criteria of joining NATO and the European Union, right? And so I'm really happy that they're talking about Ukraine joining NATO. I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that NATO has said that uh, Ukraine, Georgia, and one other country are, are all in line to join NATO someday, but nobody's going to let Ukraine in as long as the Crimea and the Donbass are, are in dispute. Right, uh, and so I'm I'm sorry to to give the bad news to the Ukrainians, but there are a lot of people who are talking about, oh, we need to bring Ukraine into NATO right now so that we can jab uh, Putin in the eye. And you know, I got bad news. Uh, NATO's not going to let NATO is as a uh, an organization that works on unanimity, as is the European Union. And honestly, I don't see either one letting Ukraine in because they don't need. The basic criteria. So the Russians, uh, not given a de jure uh, veto, figured out how to create a de facto veto. And it was too late for the Baltic states and Poland, but not too late for them to do these operations here. So this is why the Russians are, are doing uh, what what, uh, what people are calling uh, frozen conflicts in this area. Uh, and so this is what the Russians are doing. Uh, the upper left-hand corner there is um, little green men in Crimea. Notice they took over Crimea without firing a shot. Uh, and this was done through um, uh, they, they said political warfare. They subverted um, Crimea beforehand. They prepared, informationally prepared, the Crimean population so that they did not fight back. So all they had to do was land, take over the key nodes, um, and the Ukrainians really had no choice but to leave. <clears throat> so this is a, this is a classic uh, operation, right? And this is the result of political warfare. You could say uh, it's hybrid because uh, we didn't know who they were, but we did. You could say that it was uh, gray zone because it literally wasn't violent, but really neither one of those concepts has anything to do with what happened in Crimea. Crimea is political warfare at its best. Uh, and then you see in the uh, right hand corner there, that's the Kirsch Strait Bridge. That's where the Russians are uh, blockading the Ukrainian Navy from passing through. Uh, so why, why is this important for Ukraine? So here is uh, before Crimea, right, where uh, they have a very clear delineation there, and Ukraine uh, claims half of the Sea of Azov, and they have the ability to exit between Crimea and Russia. Uh, and guess what? After Russia took uh, Crimea, now they've claimed new water, and look at that, um, Mariupol, uh, the major port city in eastern Ukraine, no longer has access to the rest of the world by sea. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is a major, major problem for Ukrainians. So uh, we've talked about hybrid, we've talked about gray zone, uh, we'll talk about those again as we continue on, but let's talk about political warfare. So this is uh, our U U.S. definition of political warfare. The last time the U.S. government define political warfare, right? Uh, logical application of Clausewitz's doctrine in the time of peace, right? Employment of all means, short of war, right? Actually, Kennan did a really interesting series. Uh, he, he worked at the National Defense University at the National War College, taught there. And so he did a series of lectures called um, Measure Short of War. It's available digitally. If you're interested, uh, email Yanis or email me directly. 
um, and I will uh, show you the connection to that, right? And so uh, everything from white to black uh, is available. So uh, you can you can learn a couple of lessons from this slide. Number one is the United States has figured out how to do political warfare in the past and succeeded at it. Uh, number two, since it came out in 1948, you can see that this was part of the basis of containment, uh, which led to a victory in the Cold War. Uh, number three, um, since we haven't updated the theory since 1948, we have no idea what we're doing, right? The American government doesn't understand political warfare. Even though we did it very well during the Cold War, today we don't know anything about it. It's much like information operations. With the US Information Agency, we were very adept at information operations during the Cold War, but we threw that all away after the Cold War, and now we're no good at it again, right? And so you can see the two are related. We can't conceptualize political warfare, and we don't conceptualize the information pillar of political warfare. And so we're really, uh, we're really fighting with one arm tied behind our back because we have failed to reconceptualize political warfare and we have failed to develop the implements to conduct uh, information operations. So a <clears throat> couple, um, couple of very key lessons here with, with this slide. Uh, so what what are the Russians doing in the gray zone? Man, you know the list is is almost endless. Uh, so physical military operations they use. It's fascinating they use the military uh, as an information tool, as an influence tool, right? So putting Iskander missiles into Kaliningrad isn't really designed to give them additional capability, it's designed to influence those around, right? And the A2AD bubbles, you have them from Novia Zemlya down to, um, to St. Petersburg, um, down to the Crimea, uh, all over the place. And so they've set up these A2AD bubbles, anti-access area denial bubbles. And so this is designed to uh, not only prevent NATO from operating there, but as a very strong and clear messages. And then the last one, um, we saw SNAP exercises earlier this year. They, uh, they brought together uh, the better part of 100,000 troops, I think it was 86,000 troops near Ukraine, near the Donbass, right? And so everybody in the West goes into a frenzy. Russians are coming. And so I saw analysis that was like, you know, are they going to attack Ukraine? What are they going to do? Why are they there? Personally, I believe they were there because Alexander uh, Navalny was giving Putin problems and uh, they wanted to, uh, to deceive everybody, right? So uh, when you do a deception plan, uh, not only do you hide what you're, uh, what you're planning, right? but you do something else really noisy somewhere else to uh, attract attention, right? It's like a magician, uh, you know, doing uh, waving a hand or with a pretty young assistant while actually behind the curtain uh, doing, doing the do. And so the, the Russians have done very well at using the military as an information tool. You see those, uh, those coercion uh, ones, I find the nuclear threats fascinating. Uh, they threatened to nuke uh, Finland or Sweden if um, if they join NATO. They threatened to nuke uh, Poland or Romania if they hosted the um, anti-ballistic missile defense systems, things like that. So they're very they're very uh, cavalier about about this. Whereas uh, other countries, you've never seen uh, France. England or the United States threaten to nuke somebody, right? It's just not really in our repertoire. And then we have all those information operations. Man, are they adept at information operations? But they've always been adept at information operations. The Chinese aren't that good. The Chinese are very good about inf uh, influencing Chinese populations, whether within China or overseas Chinese. 
but the Chinese really don't care about everybody else. We're barbarians to them, so why bother, right? Whereas the Russians uh, have a long history of having a very strong analytic capability, which enables them, because they understand, they have people that understand these other cultures, they can put together uh, very competent uh, information operations. Not all of them are competent, just like not all of their intelligence operations or special operations are competent, but enough of them are that they have a significant impact. Uh, cyber operations are uh, too numerous to, uh, to count. Uh, last year we did solar winds, and then this year we had the Capital Pipeline and JBS Meatpacking Company both shut down, both had an impact on the economy of the United States. So this shows that the, uh, the Russians are testing out different pieces of our critical infrastructure, uh, just like the Iranians who were caught in uh, American banks and American dams, right, uh, which hold back the water dams. Uh, and so they're, I think they're testing our, uh, our political resolve and our critical infrastructure one piece at a time. So these are Russian strategic objectives. This is my personal analysis on Russian strategic objectives. Number one, regime survival. Putin knows that if he uh, if he's no longer in charge, there's going to be a lot of people after him, right? Some will be from the West, legal uh, legal cases, and some honestly will be from Russia. And so he's got to be uh, in charge forever. You know, the good czar, bad czar, you know, uh, a bad czar would be uh, Nicholas II. Uh, a good czar would be like Ivan the Terrible or uh, Stalin, right? And, and they are carried out of the Kremlin feet first. You, you, you don't quit, right? Because you're serving the Russian state. Bad czar, Nicholas II, Gorbachev, what do they have in common? They both quit. They're quitters, they're bad, right? Good czar stays forever. Bad czar quits. What do you think Putin thinks he is? He thinks he's a good czar, right? Uh, they want to regain their their buffer zone. They, of course, they've been invaded since uh, 1812 uh, at least three times by uh, uh, European coalitions, and so uh, they're kind of hinky about that. Unfortunately, as the Cold War proved, there's no such thing as a big enough buffer zone for to keep the Russians happy. They would have to control all the way to Lisbon, Portugal, before they would think that there's no threat coming from Europe. They want to be treated as an equal. Uh, President Obama in 2015 uh, uh, mentioned them as a regional power, and that really, really irritated Putin. Uh, they've got to keep the money flowing. Why? Because the Russian people don't have the capability to fire Putin. Okay, their, uh, their elections are fixed, um, very competently fixed, right? But everybody knows that they're fixed, including the Russian people. And so literally the oligarchs and the Siloviki, who are the uh, former security force people who really run the government for Putin, he's the, uh, he's the only, they're the only ones he trusts. Uh, he's got to keep them happy. Uh, the Siloviki may not be in it for the money, uh, but they certainly have to make a certain amount of money to keep them quiescent. They're not going to work for free. There's a lot of corruption, again, still in the Russian government. I've seen estimates that uh, a third of their military budget just kind of disappears, right? And then, of course, in order to do this, they want to fracture us, uh, our international organizations like NATO and the European Union and our democracies. They're working from within. In these, uh, in these different operations. And then you see down at the bottom there, uh, Putin in the 2007 Munich Security Conference, which we talked about already. So, uh, so information, right? Uh, let's think about information for a bit. Remember I said we're not very good at information? Um, first of all, we can't call it information operations because there's an information operations community. So when we say information operations, they're like, no, you can't call it that. We've already got that name. So we have to call it operations in the information environment. The fact that a very small piece of our information community can veto us from using the most logical term to describe this shows you the, uh, 
the weakness of the entire uh, information aspect, right? And so there's uh, five different uh, elements down there that are wholly within uh, the uh, information environment, and then the others are uh, are partially within. The physical one uh, sometimes requires some explanation. That would be the Russians doing military maneuvers to distract from Navalny, right? So it, a the informational aspect of a physical operation. But, you know, it, it's really interesting. Public Affairs says they don't do information operations. Uh, uh, you know, public diplomacy would be, I guess, part of, that's uh, part of public affairs. They say they don't do uh, information operations. They're just reporting the news. They're reporting the truth, stuff like that. And so uh, notice that all these are separate. These are all stovepipes. Now, there are absolutely superb people and organizations in every one of these, right? But they're all stovepiped. They're not put together at all. They are not even synchronized, much less coordinated, right? And so this, this uh, is a graphic demonstration of, of the weakness in the U.S. perspective. Uh, also, sorry, I missed one from the U.S. perspective. The American people don't trust the American government to do information operations. So we actually have a law from 1948 called smith Munt that very specifically prohibits the U.S. government from performing propaganda is the phrase or internal information operations on the U.S. population. You can do public service announcements and you can do political ads, but you cannot do information operations domestically in the United States because of the law. Russia is very different, right? They think in terms of information confrontation. They're confronting us informationally. Uh, they're using concepts like active measures and reflexive control. And those all those are all concepts that are 100 years old. Um, desinformatia, right? Disinformation. Uh, Maskirovka, which is uh, uh, weakly, uh, not strongly defined, translated as deception, but it, it's more than that, right? But that's uh, hardwired into the Russian culture. And notice all of this stuff is in the same area, right? It is commanded and controlled from the Kremlin, right? And everybody, they give everybody the same mission set, and then everybody goes off and does their thing. It's really interesting to watch how the Russians do this. Uh, Putin does not give commands like uh, uh, prevent Hillary Clinton from becoming the president of the United States in 2016. Uh, he just makes kind of, uh, I understand, offhand remarks like, uh, geez, wouldn't it be nice if we could weaken Hillary Clinton? And then everybody in all these different communities takes that as a tasker and runs off and does their thing. But this is very tightly coordinated uh, and synchronized so that they're trying to uh, increase each other's effects. So it's a very, very different conceptualization, uh, national conceptualization, cultural conceptualization of information operations, right? And uh, so here's the hybrid uh, operations with Russian characteristics. Here's the violence part. I was surprised, you know, because the people think of the Russians as being very violent, and it is a very violent culture, right? But if you think about the, the huge number of operations, very few of them are violent. Why is that? It's not because they don't like being violent. And Stalin, uh, Stalin used violence as a first resort to keep everybody under control, not only in the Soviet Union, but in the Warsaw Pact. And, uh, you know, they exported that violence elsewhere. Look at uh, uh, Trotsky being uh, spiked in the head with an ice axe in Mexico in 1940, right? So they weren't afraid to kill people. They, uh, they were actually very good at it, right? And so one would say, well, they're, they're still good at it. They don't practice it as much as they did under Stalin, but they're still pretty good at it. Uh, look at the Skripal uh, poisoning, right? Um, or what they've done to Alexander and Navalny. But they've discovered that there's a certain inutility to violence, right? And, um, and why is that? Uh, because it attracts attention. And so the vast majority of things that they do, they don't want to attract attention because it's against international law. 
because it's a, it's targeting other countries. And so they would prefer for their operations just to kind of happen and have an influence, right? They don't want to alert people that uh, their targets. So the Lisa case was a um, an information operation where they said that um, a bunch of Muslim men had raped a German woman, girl of Russian descent, right? And so this was an information operation, uh, but it was revealed as a hoax. And so now the Germans are irritated. So the, the Russians would have preferred for the Lisa case to just be there and influence people. Uh, but what happened was it ended up irritating Germans. It's kind of like uh, the Chinese and their wolf warrior diplomats. They've discovered that uh, when your elbows are too sharp, you irritate people. So that's, you got to stay below that threshold, right? So if you look at this, uh, the, the only overt government sanctioned violence that the military used was the invasion of Georgia. Notice that they tricked the Georgians into starting that, right? So they could finish it. The Donbass is deniable, right? Um, Crimea wasn't really violent and targeted killing is violent, but it's um, small scale violence against one or two people. Um, and you know, that's an information operation as well. Um, if you read Alexander Butterworth's uh, book, The World That Never Was, uh, you'll discover that, uh, that the Russians have been uh, targeting exiles with information operations and targeted killing for 150 years, right? And so they're, they're very adept at this. And so every one Russian exile that you kill, uh, you end up influencing a whole bunch of others to keep their mouth shut. And that's really what that is. It's a violent influence operation. But I was surprised when I ran the numbers on uh, uh, how little actual violence is occurring. Uh, and, and that's part of that staying below that threshold that allows for a military response. So what are we doing about it? We're, we're trying all these different things right here, right? But political doesn't mean political warfare right? Military doesn't mean military invasion. And so we're going to go through a little bit of that here. So uh, this is what it looked like a couple of years ago. This is what it looks like now. You know, somebody looks a lot happier. Uh, so we're doing a lot of diplomacy. And uh, there's uh, President Biden with the NATO uh, Secretary General. Everybody's smiling, right? Uh, this is what it used to look like. This is what it looks like now. Putin's not looking very happy, is he, right? This is uh, the meeting earlier this week. Um, notice that uh, President Biden took a tough line, a, rhetoric, a rhetorically tough line with Putin, but he didn't apparently threaten him. Uh, we haven't gotten all the readouts out of it yet, but the cyber part uh, is really interesting. Uh, at the end of it, you know, Trump and Putin did a, uh, a mutual uh, news report. Uh, Biden and Putin did separate ones. So P Biden says, uh, if in fact they violate these basic norms, cyber norms, uh, referring to the um, uh, pipeline operation and things like that, we will respond. Okay, well, that's rhetorically very nice. Uh, but if you look at uh, President Obama's cyberspace strategy, uh, they said that we would respond, and, and I'm not sure we did. We've done some operations, but uh, you know, if you were doing a, uh, if you were cleaving to international law and it was proportionate and legitimate, you would shut down a pipeline in Russia, and nobody's done that since uh, we. We blew up a pipeline in Russia in the 1980s, if I recall, but we haven't done anything like that. And so uh, I'm not sure uh, we have the political will to do it. At least we have the political will now to confront the Russians, but I'm not sure what we're going to do about it. Uh, here's the G7 summit. And so the G7 got together 
and very strongly uh, denounced Russia for their information and cyber operations, things like that. And so this group is now united uh, in uh, pressuring the Russians. Uh, here's the signing of the NATO treaty. I was lucky enough to be invited to be in that room for the 70th anniversary a couple of years ago. Uh, and so what's NATO doing about this? Hmm. Well, uh, not only did we have a G summit meeting this week, not only did we have a, uh, a bilateral Putin Biden meeting this week, but we also had a, a NATO summit this week. And interestingly enough, uh, when you look at the, uh, the, uh, communique, right? At the end of every summit, they issue a communique and everybody who's anybody gets uh, a section of the communique. And I, uh, I pulled the cyber part of it. And, uh, and so it was, uh, much larger than the cyber chapter, cyber paragraphs in uh, previous, uh, summit declarations. Note that NATO does not do offensive cyber operations. Uh, NATO has said that there is room for offensive cyber operations in support of NATO operations, but that NATO is not going to do them. Uh, friendly actors, allies, essentially, will do cyber operations for NATO if necessary. The other important thing to know is that uh, the last secretary general said that um, uh, cyber operations could trigger a an Article Five situation, right? And as a matter of fact, uh, just like there's a lot of discussion in Washington D.C. right now about uh, uh, Ukraine joining NATO, there's a lot of discussion in uh, in Washington D.C. right now about uh, Article Five and cyber triggering Article Five, and when does that happen? As a matter of fact, I've been asked to write uh, an op-ed about that. So uh, this weekend I'll be finishing off an op-ed. And uh, unfortunately, if you like look at the Talon Manual, if you do, if your adversary doesn't meet one of those four criteria: property damage, property destroyed, people hurt, people are killed. If you don't do that, you're not going to get an Article Five. Remember that an Article Five is a vote by the North Atlantic Council. And, you know, it's going to be really hard to get 30 countries to agree uh, to uh, to adopt an Article 5 for a cyber operation. It would have to be a major cyber operation that either destroyed something or killed a bunch of people. Uh, so um, more on that. Uh, that's, that's a developing situation, and we'll never have, I don't believe, the definitive answer for that. So here's Article 5, right? An attack on uh, one is an attack on all. Uh, Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations, remember we talked about armed attack, now we uh, can talk about armed attack in cyberspace, right? Uh, or use of force. Uh, and so this is Article 5, it's only been uh, invoked once, and that was on behalf of the United States in support of the United States after 9-11. Uh, there have been a handful of requests from Turkey and one from Poland to declare an Article 5. All of those were given an Article 4, which is uh, consultation. So Article 5 is really seen as, and uh, when I use this phrase, uh, it doesn't mean they're going to be used. It's the nuclear option, right? It's the last option. I'm not advocating for using nuclear weapons in an Article 5 situation. What I'm saying is it's it's the last thing that everybody wants to pull out, right? So uh, this is another thing that NATO has been doing. This is uh, Steadfast December 21. So we just finished this exercise. Notice uh, it did a couple of uh, innovative things. See the reinforcement by sea? Although we used to do that a lot, uh, it's innovative now because we haven't done that in quite a while. Um, note that the United States uh, reactivated Second Fleet, the Navy's Second Fleet in Norfolk, and that's the fleet that traditionally has guarded the sea lanes of communications between North America and Europe. Uh, notice the reinforcement by land. <clears throat> There's a lot of uh, a lot of talk about uh, military mobility. Uh, you've heard Lieutenant General Ben Hodges talk about uh, military Schengen agreements. Uh, I've talked to uh, senior uh, leaders 
at the national level, not at NATO, about this. And they say, hey, sure, when there's a war, you can move across our border just like this. But there isn't a war, so we don't have a legal structure to move all this stuff. So it takes you 21 days to get permission to move munitions and uh, war materials uh, across the German border. It's not the Ministry of Defense that controls that. It's the Ministry of the Interior, right? It's the border people. So that's why the second major innovation that NATO has done recently is standing up uh, a, uh, a joint logistics command in Ulm, Germany, and they are designed to do military mobility. Notice that rapid reaction down there. The uh, Turks took over the uh, very high readiness joint task force, which is the uh, uh, one brigade and air and et cetera, um, that comes out the door in 48 hours. The rest of the uh, the rest of the NATO response force, the 30-day uh, thing, the, the the JTF moves a lot faster than that. The Turks took that over at the beginning of the year, and they practiced deploying from Turkey uh, into Romania for that. So this is uh, this is what they've been doing: 9,000 participants, 20 participating nations. So we're doing this kind of stuff to signal the Russians. Check this out. Uh, this is uh, this is just a picture of a bunch of American dudes getting off an airplane, right? And obviously in Germany. But guess what this is? This is the return of the Fifth Corps headquarters to Europe. Okay. We took, I wrote the congressional testimony that said, oh, please don't take the last of the tanks out of Europe. Obama took the last of the tanks out of Europe anyway. Trump hated uh, NATO and, uh, and unilaterally decided to diminish the forces in Europe. Uh, luckily, the American governing structure prevented him from doing that uh, because we have checks and balances, because we're a rule of law country. But... Uh, we had started, we put a division headquarters. We didn't put a division headquarters in Europe. We put the one-star deputy division commander with the division tactical headquarters in Europe years ago uh, so that they could command and control American forces before Article 5. And now you're seeing a core headquarters come back to Europe. Uh, and they're coming into Europe to participate in steadfast the uh, defender. 21, but uh, that that means they're aligned against Europe and they're going to stay, right? Fifth Corps has just been reactivated. And so that means we've got a division headquarters there to uh, handle our three maneuver brigades. And now we've got a core headquarters in which we'll be able to handle more than one division. So that's the reinforcements coming in. Nobody said anything about this. There was... Uh, very, there was no fanfare about this. Nobody said, "Woo, the Americans are back." Nobody said anything. A lot of people didn't catch this. I happened to because somebody asked me about the exercise, and I'm like, "Oh, look, isn't that really interesting?" So there's a lot of sub rosa stuff happening as well. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, I wanted to take an hour to talk, and then a half an hour for discussion. Uh, everybody's using the gray zone, uh, aggressive but not violent. We talked about, uh, you know. You want to not be violent unless you're sending a message with that violence. Uh, Eastern Europe, hugely important. Uh, Russia, information, right? And we're, we, we are challenged by gray zone operations. We haven't figured out what to do about them. Uh, but hopefully this has been helpful in, in uh, conceptualizing, you know, the difference between gray zone and hybrid operations. Remember, gray zone is where? Uh, it's below the threshold that allows for a military response. Remember that it has four, uh, four criteria. You've got to meet one of those four criteria to pass uh, that threshold. Remember, hybrid is a method of organizing and operating. It's not a where. Uh, gray zone is where. Hybrid is a how. And, you know, it, they're all really interesting labels, but really kind of not utilitarian. Uh, I believe political warfare covers uh, the gamut on this and uh, uh, hybrid and uh, gray zone, maybe stove pipes underneath political warfare, but I think it would be a lot more utilitarian if we just admitted publicly that we're doing political warfare, which is the use of all elements of national power to gain your political goals below the threshold of military operations.
and with that, Giannis, uh, I am now ready for a half an hour of uh, discussion. Okay. Thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. And um, before opening the floor for q and A, I I will use my advantage as, as the moderator to, to start the discussion by by asking you this. Uh, I've been, as you know, researching political warfare, like the Russian way myself. And uh, so I've been studying uh, uh, the, the tools of, of political warfare within the framework of what the Russians call um, new generation warfare. And, uh, and you must include uh, reflexive control and all these, like, uh, the active measures and masquerade and, and everything. So, but uh, but um, uh, I think you're right when you say that the Russian they they want to achieve political objectives. And uh, what I see is, and this is my question, what I see is uh, that many people have been talking about it, right? That there is this, and usually the answer that. Uh, uh, or the way to 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 do, let's say, deterrence. The way to deter that is deterrence by denial, meaning, for example, that people should learn to identify fake news. That people should be more literate and and uh, and uh, to not believe on these uh, on WhatsApp, on Facebook, whatever. Now, what I've seen from research is that there is a huge a uh, gap between the state and society. And uh, this gap has been increasing in the last 20 years, meaning that the level of confidence of the population in the government, especially in Europe, has been decreasing. And, uh, and uh, in my opinion, it's getting danger. So uh, I would like you to uh, to comment this. How how do we deter it in the West? Because they are using our democracy against ourselves. But at the same point, at the same point, it seems that society is not believing in our in our democratic system. That's my question. So um, you've put your finger on the question. That's the money question, Giannis. Is is uh, uh, what do we do about? It? And, and we just haven't figured out what to do about it. Uh, I believe the problem is with the political elites. Uh, they haven't figured out that we've got a problem, right? Uh, I did a, uh, a study on the, the, the transition from uh, 1945, August 1945, end of the Cold War and the creation of the US Information Agency in 1953. And it took us several years to get it together. Uh, the, uh, it took until 1947 to uh, recreate uh, the intelligence community, which we had shut down at the end of World War II. Uh, we shut down the information community at the end of World War II. Uh, we, Smith Munt was 1948. Uh, that's the act that prohibits uh, the uh, U.S. propaganda inside the United States. But at the same time, what nobody realizes, because they haven't read the law, it actually required the creation of a what would become the U.S. Information Agency. So, I mean, Joe Nye talks about uh, the deterrence and denial as the traditional, uh, traditional, uh, sorry, uh, punishment and denial as deterrence, a traditional deterrence, and then he adds uh, norms and entanglement. And we've tried norms and entanglement, and it just hasn't worked. You notice President Biden talks about if they violate these norms. Well, they, we don't even agree on what the norms are, right? Uh, we we uh, had a process called the Group of Government Experts in the UN uh, that was working on it. And in 2015, there was a breakthrough agreement. And then in 2017, um, uh, the Cubans acting on behalf of the Russians and the Chinese tore everything apart and it destroyed the group of government experts uh, system. The poor uh, guy in charge ended up just quitting and, and, <laughs> and taking a post in Mazar el Sharif in northern Afghanistan just to get away from UN cyber for a while. Uh, so uh, it's very, very frustrating. Um, 
what we need is political leaders in the West who believe in the system, want to support the system, uh, and do things to take care of the people, right? Uh, because we're all res uh, representative democracies. And so our representatives in the legislative assembly, in the executive, um, are supposed to be taking care of the population, right? Um, and if there's significant chunks of the population that feel that these leaders are not taking care of them, then they're going to be irritated. And, and that is the population that the Russians are taking advantage of, right? Uh, if you're a, a, uh, uh, a diehard nationalist uh, for the UK, uh, they'll, they'll have another approach for you, right? Uh, they, uh, for instance, uh, we saw in the United States where the Russians would invite uh, a Black Lives Matter group to a place at a time and then invite a, a Blue Lives Matter, a pro-police group, to the same place at the same time with a hope of creating more friction, right? And so the lack of leadership by our political elites dissatisfies the people and then the Russians take advantage of that dissatisfaction. And so, so that's number one, is the elites have to have a vision like they did in the Cold War, right? They created a vision, but it took a while. Uh, created a vision, hey, we're, we're in competition here. We've got to do something about it. So we built the structures, uh, the political uh, structures to deal with it, which we did. We just haven't woken up yet. I'm not saying we're in the middle of a new Cold War. I'm saying we are challenged and it requires our political leaders to come up with a concept of how to confront it. That's number one. Number two is education, right? We've stopped teaching uh, civics in our schools by and large. Uh, so people in the United States, for instance, in the, not the last election, but the election before were surprised by the electoral college, which is in the constitution, right? And it's not a big document. You should be reading the constitution. Americans should be reading the constitution and the Declaration of Independence once a year so they can figure out what the rules are and not be surprised, right? And so uh, huge levels of ignorance among our populations because they don't care, right? Because we're prosperous, we're at peace. So who cares about the government? Who cares about elections? You know, I'm, I'm gonna spend my weekends, uh, I'm gonna spend my summer in the woods uh, of New Hampshire, right? And so I really don't care about who's in charge in Washington, DC. That's not uh, in effect for me because I'm a national security professional, but by and large, the vast majority of all of our populations in Europe and North America are quiescent. Because um, you know uh, we're prosperous uh, and we're at peace. The other so education is the last one. We've got to educate our people uh, on uh, why is democracy good, why is free trade good, why is human rights good, why is freedom of religion and freedom of speech good, you know why is autocracy bad, why is tyranny bad, um, and we need to have cyber hygiene. Right. Uh, we the the reason these people are successful in their cyber operations is because we're really bad at it. Ninety percent of successful cyber operations start with a phishing operation. Alex, click on me. Right. Uh, because people click on the link. Why is that? Because they're ignorant. Right. Uh, it's not stupidity. It's ignorance. And so uh, education would go a long way. Civics education and cyber hygiene education would go a long way towards diminishing uh, the impact of their operations. Okay, thank you very much. Let me, let me close your presentation. And uh, let me open the floor for, for questions. Please feel free to, to, to ask. Raise your hand or indicate in the chat that you have a question and uh, I will open the microphone for you. Well, it seems that no questions. <laughs> Ah, okay, there is one, one hand here. My colleague 
use it, Yuka, she works with me. Use it, you can ask. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, first, I would like to thank you for your great presentation and uh, explanations and a lot of good points. And uh, I just, uh, I would be interested uh, maybe to hear your comment uh, regarding yesterday's uh, summit in Geneva. Uh, it was uh, quite interesting uh, positions uh, by both from uh, US and uh, Russia regarding the cyber uh, security. And um, do you think there is uh, some maybe um, good possibility to strengthen the uh, I mean, legislative or institutional norms. So in the future, this dimension could be more understandable, less risks, or it's maybe too naive question. Thank you. Thank you, Ilse. Um So the, the Russians will agree to norms and then they'll violate them. Because that's what they do, right? I mean, it's uh, you know, it's part of the Maskirovka desinformatsia paradigm, right? Uh, uh, think about you know the Chinese lawfare, right? Stuff like that. Uh, China, the three warfares are uh, media warfare, propaganda warfare, and lawfare, right? And so um, they may or may not agree to these things, but then they're just going to violate them anyway. So um, we, as rule of law countries, uh, want norms and agreements, right? And, and so we're looking for them. Uh, notice President Biden very specifically said, if they violate these norms, right, uh, the norms of proper behavior in cyberspace. And so the next iteration of norms is um, critical infrastructure. Uh, we will all agree not to operate against each other's critical infrastructure. Uh, and uh, in the United States, we have a, a very solid definition of critical infrastructure. We have uh, the Department of Homeland Security, which has been around since uh, 2003. Uh, it was created after the 9-11 attacks and they have a critical infrastructure division. And so they've identified 16 different categories of critical infrastructure. So it's, uh, uh, the electricity grid, the transportation grid, uh, the financial system, uh, the electoral system, interestingly enough, was recent after two, 2016, they added the electoral system, the physical uh, and uh, electrical cyber uh, system for, for elections. So that's, I believe, where we're going to try to go next is, um, okay, Russia, you're going to do cyber operations against us. We understand that, but here's our list of, like, you know, this is our red line. If you, you know, if you do something against a, uh, a pipeline, right, that's, that's a red line for us. Um, there's, there's two, two problems with that. Uh, number one is, the Russians, <clears throat> when the Chinese, when the U.S. wants to expand cyber capability, they build a reserve component center next to Google and try to recruit people from Google. When the Chinese want to expand cyber capability, they tell IT organizations and universities that they are hosting a cyber militia, right, at their cost. Uh, when the Russians want to expand their cyber capability, they mobilize cyber criminals. If, uh, if the Russian, when the Russians capture a, identify and capture a cyber criminal, uh, that criminal has two choices. You can go to jail or you can work for the Russian government, right? So uh, part-time they do cyber crime uh, to make a living and part-time they do cyber crime on behalf of the Russian government. So the pipeline operation, was it a criminal operation? Was it a criminal operation uh, that was sanctioned by the Russian state? Or was it a criminal operation that was done specifically on the orders of the Russian state? 
And because we don't know that, um, it's very difficult uh, attribution, physical attribution of it came from this computer is actually, according to friends of mine, uh, very senior cyber people, attribution, what computer did it, isn't that hard, okay? But who was sitting at the computer and who are they taking orders from is very hard, right? Because it's not, uh, it's not tangible, right? You can follow a signal back to a computer, an individual uh, IP address, right? But who did that? So you, the burden of proof now is on the victim. So the Chinese and the Russians are very good when, when we say the Russians did this, the Russians say, okay, give us the proof. They're not interested in proving things in a court of law. They're interested in what they did wrong and how we figured it out so that they can avoid that in the future. So they're, they're, they're like, hey, you know, prove it. Give us the proof. Uh, and, you know, and uh, we'd be happy, wink, wink, to, to action it for you. But what they really want is the information on how we caught them. So uh, we're having a big, big problem there. Uh, and again, uh, I think that, that uh, Giannis was talking about uh, deterrence by denial. If we uh, inoculate our, our populations by giving them civics uh, education uh, to support our democracy and uh, cyber education, uh, they will be a much harder target to get through. Uh, and which would achieve uh, deterrence by denial. Did that answer your question, Ilsa? Yes, thank you. Thank you for your great sense of humor. And um, yes, uh, it's just from my side, I think the uh, civic, civic education and both this combined political vision, it could take quite a, quite a time. So yes. what to do in between? Well, we are in a window of vulnerability in between. It's just like cyber. Uh, I ran the numbers because you can tell from my hair that I'm not a born cyber person. I'm a late comer to cyber. Uh, it will be 2050 before digital natives are our senior leaders. So between now and 2050, we have a 30 year window of vulnerability where we have ignorant people in charge uh, I actually have on a, a transcript of uh, a very senior Republican senator uh, saying on a uh, on a news show, I've never proudly announcing, I've never sent an email in my life, right? And here's a guy that is very influential legislator who's responsible for promulgating and supporting uh, cyber legislation, who's never sent an email. So... We've got a window of vulnerability of 30 years in cyber anyway. It, every year, more and more digital natives will have more and more influence, but it'll take until 2050 before everybody in senior leadership is a digital native. So yes, it's, it, this is one of those things like the Cold War, it took decades to do. And so we need to kind of get it together. Okay, more questions, please. More questions, please. Okay, while people are are thinking about about possible questions, I have then another question. That is, uh, since then, uh, what we are seeing is the increasing utilization of non-military means to achieve the objectives that classically would be the, the objectives of warfare. Uh, okay, so what is the role of the armed forces then? How, how, is, how do you see the role of the armed forces in the future now? Is it changing, not changing? Because I see there is a problem of, let's say, mandate, right? Because many, many issues are not necessarily the responsibility of the armed forces. But uh, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a, the armed forces are the, 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 the guarantor of national security. 
right? And uh, and uh, how how do you see that? So um, the uh, the Russian armed forces are used as a signaling tool, an influencing tool, right? Uh, they they put a lot of money into the military because 2008 operations in Georgia showed that they had significant weaknesses. And so this is one of the things that has President Obama in 2015 saying Russia is a regional power, right? And so what we, uh, what the Russians want to do is, is remember back to that Russian strategic objectives, be treated as an equal, especially by the United States. They feel that they have to be militarily powerful in order for everybody to respect them, right? They're, uh, they are into the, it's better to be feared than respected, right? Better to be feared than to be loved. They, they tried not very hard to get along with everybody else and failed. And so now they're like, okay, if, if you don't like us, if you don't love us, then you will fear us. And so that's what the, the Russian military is all about. In the West, the, you know, if you look at the NATO and the European Union, if you look at hard power and soft power, internal and external, uh, NATO is responsible for hard power external. But if you look at hard power internal, soft power internal, soft power external, the European Union owns all those responsibilities. So it's really not the, the responsibility of the military uh to to do much right i mean we're this is the deterrence uh they are preventing the russians from physically attacking militarily attacking nato allies is really what it boils down to right uh and uh because we're faced with all these different problems like migration from africa right so if you imagine a northwest southeast line through Europe, uh, the United Kingdom is north of that line, France is south of that line, uh, and then it, it uh, goes through like Bulgaria maybe, right? Um, I'm not sure what anchors that lower right-hand corner, but everybody north of that line is worried about the Russians. Everybody south of that line is worried about Africa and the Middle East, right? Uh, and so uh, it's very hard to convince Spain or Italy or Portugal uh, or even France to confront Russia and leave migration alone. So NATO now is, is doing a 360 thing. So they've got the north, the high north, the Arctic, they've got the east, and then they've got the south, right? And so NATO understanding that uh, Italy is more concerned with migration than with the Russians. NATO is helping out, even though migration from Africa and the Middle East is not a NATO mission, NATO is helping out the European Union uh, and the nations down there with those missions because they know that's the only way to get everybody on board they have to do the south and the east simultaneously or they're going to lose half of nato half of nato is just going to say i'm sorry i really don't want to be part of the enhanced forward presence uh so you know and so it'd be very hard to do enhanced forward presence with only half of the countries in uh in nato right uh also that would expose a very large rift between the Southwest and the Northeast that the Russians would love to exploit. Um, so uh, militaries are doing non-military missions because the missions exist. They don't take primacy for them. The uh, NATO Standing Maritime Group One will never take charge of migration missions in the Mediterranean, but they will always help uh, the European Union and the states with that because they have the actual uh, platforms, right? It's just like the, the U.S. Navy doesn't do counter-drug operations, but if you stick a U.S. Coast Guard person on a U.S. Navy ship, 
that U.S. that Coast Guard person can do counter drug operations using, you know, the very strong radar, for instance, military radar, stuff like that. So you're seeing an expansion of uh, military roles. You're seeing a very reluctant expansion because the militaries don't want to do that, right? Uh, so it's very reluctant, and there's always going to be a dynamic tension between, hey, that that magnificent, expensive military, uh, you know, we've got problems. We need that military to help out. And the military is saying, no, we don't do drugs. We don't do migration. We do national defense. And if all of my ships are in the Mediterranean doing migration stuff, then I'm not available to do national defense. So there's a dynamic tension there. Uh, and that dynamic tension is not going to go away because our adversaries are challenging us in the non-military areas. 